Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I will be your host for today. And we've been having a great March so far. It's been a lot of fun. And we're going to continue along today with Imogene Cancelier. She's a wildlife biologist and landscape geneticist researching rare and elusive species. So she combines field and laboratory techniques to better understand carnivores and the relationships uh, with animals as well as their landscape. So she studied wildlife all over the United States, from bears to fishers to newts, and she's also currently researching uh, snow leopard genetics, which is pretty darn cool. Uh, she's also a science communicator using social media to talk about cool wildlife and also to help uh, teach others about uh, interesting careers in wildlife conservation. So Imogene, it's so great to have you joining us for your second hangout today. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me again. Hi, everybody. How are you? Raise your hand if you can hear me. Wave at me. Let me turn their mics on. Let's hear them this morning. Nice and loud, boys and girls. Can you say hi? Yeah, what do you <laughs> Well, it's awesome to be with all of you. I'm happy to be hanging out, and I appreciate you guys wanting to hang out and spend your time with me this morning to talk about wildlife as well as carnivores. So before we get started, um, a couple different things. I have a PowerPoint that I wanna share with you that's got some cool pictures and information about my career and the things that I do currently, um, as well as highlight some of the things that I think are important in wildlife. Um, but before that, just so you can see my face and know whose voice is uh, actually talking, I'm Imogene. I'm currently talking to you from Newark, Delaware, where I am a second year PhD student, so I'm still in school, and I am researching snow leopards like Joe said, and I will briefly explain that here in a minute. I've been a wildlife biologist for about eight years, and I've done a lot of different research, and now I focus mostly on field and genetics research. So with that, my face is going to disappear because I'm going to share my screen with you and chat with us, chat with you all about uh, carnivores and wildlife biology as a career. So I should be disappearing right now. You guys should be seeing yourself. But I'm going to throw up a PowerPoint here so we can chat for the next 20-ish minutes. Okay, so I want to talk today to you guys about being a carnivore biologist or being a bi wildlife biologist in general. But for me as a carnivore biologist, I'm going to get into some of the nitty-gritty of this. So specifically, the what, the where, the why, and the how of wildlife biology. Well, first of all, what is a wildlife biologist? Well, a wildlife biologist is a lot of different things. Very briefly, a wildlife biologist studies or manages wild animals in their habitats. That includes a lot of different things. There are a huge, there's a huge variation of jobs that are available for people who want to be wildlife biologists. That's me with the bobcat, um, but by no means is that something that I do every single day. Um, and by no means is that something that you have to do if you want to, say, work for birds, for example. So there are a lot of different options, like I said. You can work in rainforests, you can work in the snow, you can work with birds. You can work with carnivores like coyotes. You can work in forests doing camera trapping. You might not be able to see in that picture, but the person who's looking up at a tree, there's a remote camera up there that's recording pictures of wildlife. You can work in museums with natural history specimens like skeletons, like skulls like these. You can work with insects. You can do bee ecology research. You can work out in remote areas on fish. You can work in the laboratory, and then you can work with several different species. You don't necessarily have to work with just one. So you can study moths, you can study snakes, you can study bobcats, um, or you can do a myriad of different things, including plant research. So wildlife biologists, really the point of this is a wildlife biologist is a lot of different things. I think a lot of people, when they think about a wildlife biologist, is they think about someone who studies only one species, like say, I'm a wolf biologist or I'm a dolphin biologist. And those jobs aren't exactly, those jobs are more few and far in between. You really need to study a lot of different things and know about a lot of different things in order to be effective as a wildlife biologist. For me, however, I generally study carnivores. So I consider myself that I use a variety of different techniques to study wildlife. For me, I have, for the most part in my career, I've studied mostly carnivores and amphibians. So my favorite things are the uh, mammalian carnivores that 
run around in forests and in deserts, but I also really like salamanders a lot. And I study both of these different groups with uh, different genetic and field methods. But for carnivores, that's really the focus of our talk today, and I want to talk a little bit about them. So some of the questions that I ask as a wildlife biologist who focuses on carnivores include things like, how do carnivores move? So how far are they moving? Where are they going? What are the things that help them move across different landscapes between mountains or across cities? How are these individuals related? So are these, are these individuals cousins? Are they not related at all? And is there a reason for that? What types of habitat do they prefer? Just because an animal is in a forest doesn't mean they use all types of forest. And this applies for all different wildlife, not just carnivores. But the, one of the overarching questions that or goals that we have is how do we conserve them given all of these different questions? And through scientific research, which is what I do, we're able to come up with answers that are able to hopefully better conserve them in the future. So, what actually is a carnivore? This might mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and more importantly, it might mean more than you think that it does. So a carnivore eats mostly meat. So when we think of that, we think of like, you know, the big African carnivores, like the lions or the hyenas or the jaguars, or maybe you think of wolves, and those are all correct, but a carnivore eats mostly the flesh of another animal. So even though I say meat, this also includes something small like a spider that predates on or eats other small insects. So basically the goal or the goal of a carnivore is to capture and eat another animal and that and that is called prey. So they're preying on another animal. And in order for them to do this, they generally have special traits for hunting. And this varies whether it is a mammal like this bobcat in this picture, which I have a lot of them today because I have studied bobcats and I'm a big fan of them. They're kind of cool. So if anyone has questions about bobcats, we can definitely talk about them in a little bit. But generally, all of your carnivores have different special traits for hunting. And there are many, many types, like I said. So everything from big cats to small insects to plants and even fungi, all of these different uh, groups and taxa in the animal kingdom include carnivores which is kind of cool because it expands our knowledge. It, there's so many more carnivores than we might initially think. It's more than just wolves. So in terms of their adaptations, there's a lot of different adaptations that carnivores use to exist on a landscape. And all of these are relevant for the conservation, which is why I want to briefly mention them. So carnivores, in terms of the special adaptations that I mentioned, speed is one of them. So, you know, I'm not a very fat, I eat meat, but I'm not a very fast runner, I'm going to be honest. However, a cheetah is the fastest running land mammal in the world, and the peregrine falcon is the, is the fastest bird in the world. I think the cheetah can get up to 60 miles per hour in three seconds, and the peregrine falcon, when uh, she's dive bombing on her prey from the sky, can reach upwards of 190 miles per hour. So they're way faster than most cars, and they're very efficient at what they do. Other things that are adaptation for carnivores are things that maybe we don't think about. So large ears are really important for carnivores because they're hunters. So they have to know where their prey is. So large ears like this gray fox on the left or this African wild dog on the right, both of these large ears help them funnel sound and able to locate their prey. So this is something that bats also do. So it's not just in, you know, the furry mammals. It's in, you know, a lot of different species. Other things that are really important is the large jaw size and the powerful bite. So one of the differences between carnivores and other species like deer, which are called herbivores, or humans, which we are omnivores, meaning we eat both meat and plant material, is that they, carnivores have special muscles in their jaw up around their eyes that enable them to have really, really powerful bite strength. What this means is that when they grab something that they want to eat, they're able to hold on to it. So not only do they have larger teeth, like the large teeth in this lion on the right, those are his canines, um, not only are these teeth really, really large, but the muscle power is really, really specific to them being able to hold on to their prey, which helps them be more successful uh, on the landscape. And all of these things are important to individuals, but they're also important to populations. And all of these different traits have you know developed over millions of years in evolution and they really are what design carnivores to be carnivores and over long periods of time they kind of help us figure out what helps them on the landscape or like how they live in their wild habitat 
And then lastly, for these things, you know, there are other ad adaptations like, you know, like I already said, strong bite power or the ability to swim really fast, uh, like the alligator on the left, or, you know, yes, this praying mantis, uh, it, he's kind of funny looking, but he is also a carnivore. And these, you know, these insects have large grasping claws that are able to help hold onto their prey. So they don't have the jaws like a lion does, but they're able to hold onto their prey with their strength. And these are all things that are really important to think about with carnivores, and they help us define what is a carnivore. The last thing that's kind of cool about carnivores is one thing that we often don't think about is their eye placement. So if you look at this seal on the left, you'll notice that his eyes are a little more forward facing. So if you put your hands on either side of your face, you will not touch your eyes. So your eyes are facing forward. And that's the same with carnivores. Whereas on the right with the zebra, his eyes are more on the side. And this is a specialty adaptation called depth perception. And this is because like, car you know, as a carnivore, they need to hunt. So they need to have really, really good vision to gauge how far they are away from something so they can know whether or not to ambush it. In contrast, the zebra needs to have eyes that help him scan the widest amount of landscape in the shortest period of time so he can hopefully avoid something like a, like a, a, a lion attacking him. So obviously a seal is not going to attack a zebra because one's in the water and one's on land and they're in different parts of the world. But hopefully you get my picture for that. So once we define what a carnivore is, it's also important to know where are carnivores. And the really cool thing that I love about carnivores is they are literally all over the world. So carnivores can be found in terrestrial and aquatic systems in nearly all climates. Uh, this is why they're so incredibly important. So this is a northern two-line salamander on the right, and you might not think about them as a carnivore because, you know, they don't have those big long teeth or they don't have these big powerful uh, forelimbs or claws and they don't run extra fast, but as adults, terrestrial salamanders are carnivorous and they predate on small insects. And they're really important because that plays a key role in the ecosystem. So because they're all over the world, that means that they are individually important to all of the different ecosystems that they live in. And as a wildlife biologist, because we are interested in the interactions between animals and their environment, it's important for us to know the roles that they play. So that gets into the issue of why care about carnivores. Well, carnivores specifically balance ecosystems. And well, the first question then is, we figured out what a carnivore is, but what is an ecosystem? So an ecosystem is the relationship between every living organism in its environment and all the factors that play into being able to exist on a landscape. So if you've seen the movie The Lion King, which is, yes, my favorite Disney movie of all time, they talk about the circle of life, and that really is actually what an ecosystem is. So this little graphic shows kind of a circle with the pink arrows, and it shows you all the different relationships that are possible between uh, carnivores like bears and wolves and birds of prey and insects, and it's all about flow of energy, and everything is related to one another. So if you take out one different species, like if you remove moose from the ecosystem, it's going to make it a lot harder for the bears and the wolves because that's their main prey source. In the same way, if you remove a carnivore, everything else is impacted. And that's because carnivores really help structure every component of the ecosystems they live in. So hunting uh, by carnivores helps balance out other species. It controls them, it helps them from going into overabundance, um, and because of that, it helps protect other animals and plant species. So when, you know, a bear is predating on a deer, it's helping the, you know, it's helping the deer population not get too high, which means the deer aren't overgrazing, which means there is more habitat for birds, which means they're helping control our insect populations, and wash, rinse, and repeat. And it does have, carnivores do other things like help minimize disease uh, in, in prey species as well as uh, minimize overpopulation. So they're really important at all different levels. Um, and you know, this bear right here doesn't, you know, this individual bear doesn't necessarily know how important he is on a landscape, but overpopulations, they play a really critical role. Now, my favorite example of this that I'll go through briefly is the Yellowstone National Park example with the reintroduction of wolves. Some of you may be familiar with it, but if you're not, I want to walk through it, starting in the top left photo. So in the 1990s, uh, wolves had been uh, gone from Yellowstone National Park um, in Wyoming for, I think, like 40 years. They had been extirpated. Humans didn't want them there, and they were gone from the landscape. 
And as a result, the entire landscape changed. There were too many elk, the tree populations and the tree uh, species diversity was different. Um, so humans decided that they wanted to put wolves back in the park because they naturally lived there. So in 1995, they put wolves back in Yellowstone. What happened was the wolves prey preyed on the elk. So moving over to the elk, they helped control the elk populations. And when they did that, uh, by, by preying on elk and also deer, they completely changed the trees on the landscape in the lower part of Yellowstone. So these trees were overgrazed. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of veget various, uh, I'm sorry, variable vegetation. Um, and it really had just grown up into a non-natural state. But when the elk populations went down, the vegetation, the plants and the trees were able to grow back up to the way they were supposed to be. And once that happened, it encouraged songbirds down in the bottom left. So that's a chickadee. It encouraged songbirds to return to this area. And when that, and after that happened, when the trees continued to grow, beavers came back to the low area of Yellowstone. And then they started setting their dams up in the water. And once the beavers came back, because there was more vegetation for them to use, their dams helped restructure the rivers rolling through Yellowstone um, to restore them back to their natural state prior to wolves being gone. And once that happened, more amphibians and insect species returned. So with the addition, with the elimination of just one species, this top carnivore, so many other groups were negatively impacted. And by putting them back on the landscape, so many different groups of individual species were positively impacted and all of them are connected to make the ecosystem better as a whole, which I think is super duper cool. And that's why I do what I do. So, you know, basically the question we have is why do we, how do we protect carnivores? It's really hard because you have, you know, loss of habitat, you have interactions with other species that are also of conservation importance. And then you have, you know, the importance of humans coexisting with them. And some people don't want to coexist with carnivores. So, you know, for us as wildlife biologists, we really need to strike a balance between conserving habitat and making sure we understand interactions with other species, and then being able to also work with humans because conservation is not about individual animals. Conservation is about populations of wild animals, but it's also about humans as well. There's a lot of different ways that we do this. Um, one of the ways that we do this, is, this, so this works for carnivores as well as other species, but I'm just mentioning it for carnivores. One of the ways that we can protect carnivores is we can set out what are called camera traps. And we can basically put a camera out in the woods that is triggered, it's a motion trigger camera and it takes cool pictures like you see in the right. So there's a snow leopard on the top right and then there's a bobcat on the bottom right. And these are basically, we can get all kinds of information about their habitat, um, and their movements and, and how many different species exist on a landscape. And that's helpful for management and conservation. We can also do live capture. So you can, you know, trap, you can safely trap and anesthetize an animal to put a radio collar on it to follow it around. You can study, you know, diseases, you can study age, you can study all kinds of types of things with regards to like movements and home range when you live capture an animal. But you can also do laboratory research as well. So you can study, again, like diseases, you can study uh, chemicals in the environment, or you can study uh, reproduction, and you can also study genetics. And that's what I do is I combine uh, lab field work, like we just mentioned, as well as lab work to better understand how carnivores move across the landscape. I'm really interested in understanding how individuals move, how populations of wild carnivores move across vast landscapes. So mo a lot of carnivores are really, really highly mobile. So that means that they cover a lot of different ground. They need a lot of habitat in order to live, which is why habitat conservation is important. But in order for us to better understand what aspects of a wild habitat we should conserve, we need to understand how an animal interacts with their landscape. No, basically, that's because not all forests are created equal. Not every forest is good for several different wildlife species and not, you know, every single forest or every single desert is going to provide all of the things that an individual population of carnivores needs. So my PhD research is looking at snow leopards. That's what these beautiful cats here on the left are. And they are in 12 countries in Central Asia. And what I'm look, interested in looking at is understanding how these individuals are like structured. So I wanna know how are they related? I wanna know what types of habitat they think are important. And I also wanna look at some individual interesting questions regarding their genetics. So genetics tells us things like how individuals are related. So this picture basically right here has a lot of different wolves. You've got on the left, you've got a yellow male, a red female, 
and an orange female. And then on the right, on the other side of a river, you've got a male. So my question is, if you, you can use genetics data, you can use DNA to determine if the orange female on the left is related to the yellow male on the right. If they are related, in this case, that means that river is not a problem for them to move because, you know, basically a, a son left his mom and set up his own house across the river. However, if nobody was related on either side of this, it might suggest that there was a barrier to animal movement. And that's really important for structuring conservation initiatives. And that's a way that it's just sim one simple way that we're able to use scientific research to conserve wildlife and wildlife habitat. And these are some of the things that I'm doing with my research on snow leopards, particularly because even though they are beautiful cats, they're also listed as vulnerable. So they are threatened with extinction. And I want my research to positively contribute to their conservation in the future. Uh, so in summary for this quick little talk, basically what it boils down to is that wildlife biologists do a lot of different things. I'm a wildlife biologist first, and I use genetics uh, data as well as field techniques to study carnivores. Uh, those carnivores can be all sizes, and they can occur all in all systems all over the world. Um, they can be foxes, they can be salamanders, they can be cute spiders, um, and each of these species plays a major role in the food, food web, and as a result, conserving them is really important for nature, but it's also really important for people. Um, and that's why I really enjoy being a wildlife biologist. Um, you know, I've studied salamanders like that marble salamander in the picture, um, but I really am a big fan of carnivores. But the cool thing about the thing Hey, Imogene, your sound's just kind of gone a little funny on us. Can you try and talk again? Oh, yeah. Can you still hear me? Okay, good. Yeah, Did we it lost... last throughout the talk? Yeah, yeah, no, it was fine throughout. I would have I would have interrupted you, but right at the very end when you were just finishing the summary, it kind of went uh, all robotic on us, and we lost you for a minute. Oh. Okay, basically carnivores are awesome, and we can talk about being a wildlife biologist now. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, so that was great. Thank you so much for that summary. Thank you for um, sharing with us all the different roles that wildlife biologists can have. And I especially love that Yellowstone story because I think it is such a great example of when you lose a keystone species like the wolf, how it can impact the whole ecosystem, but then their return had such a huge impact as well. Absolutely. All right, so we're gonna open things up uh, to questions for our classrooms joining in. We had two more classrooms, but one of them dropped out. They were having trouble with their sound. And just as you finished off, um, the other class disappeared. So I'm wondering if they're having tech issues, but we'll see if they're able to come back in. Okay. Um, but just a reminder, we do have some groups who are watching live on YouTube. If you do wanna send in some questions for Imogene, you can send them into the YouTube live uh, chat sidebar, and we will make sure that we get a couple of those in. So let us know where you're watching from as well. But for now, let's go to our first class. We've got a group of great two students, and they're joining us in Kalispell, Montana, and they came in extra early to hang out. Uh, in great Here's the big thing. I, I'm wondering, um, do you guys see the animals? Say that one more time. Yes, you know. I'm wondering if, if you guys could save the animals, if they're like sick or something. Yeah, so that's a good Animals out in the field. So one of the things that I do is I don't often, right now for my research is I'm not catching snow leopards. So I'm not able to see you know, how healthy or if any, you know, if one is sick or has an injury, I'm not able to treat it. But for the projects that I have worked on, if you catch an animal for a specific reason, and we go to basically give it like a doctor's checkup when we're getting information from it, we're able to sometimes apply like an antibiotic ointment if there is an injury um, or even like a certain medication um, 
if the animal is not doing well. It kind of depends on the project, but one of the most important things that we do is if we are going to work up an animal, we take a lot of different precautions. So not any, not just anybody can catch a wild animal. I have, you know, you have to have training. You have to often have a veterinarian out there with you, um, and you also often have to have vaccinations of your own. And like any surgery that humans have, when you get, you know, a medicine that makes you go to the sleep, so the doctor can work on you. These medicines have to be monitored very closely to make sure that the animal doesn't have a bad reaction. So we always have a plan to make sure that the safety of the animal is on the forefront of our minds. And fortunately, in my experience, we've never had a bad incident. All right. So I just want to check in. I see Mrs. Panaviski has managed to come back in. Um, had a, wasn't working out for you? Well, really bad delay. So like word is I'm not sure what's happening okay you're a little bit a little bit slow delayed as well so I wonder if it might just be um, maybe the internet just slowed down on your end because you're a little bit laggy too possibly with issue but um, like every word is broken up in words yeah okay but have other class out maybe I mean not browse maybe Okay, yeah, I, I'm getting that with you too, getting the hard, the hard come in. But that's okay, if your students do have any questions for Imogene, um, you're more than welcome to email them to me and I can pass them on. Also, All right. really quickly, Kalispell classroom, I used to live in Whitefish. So my very first job. <laughs> graduated college was working on bobcats on Flathead National Forest. So oh. I know where you guys are, and I miss Montana. <laughs> oh, so cool. Thumbs up. They like that. So grade twos, do you have another question? Then we'll meet our other classroom. Um, Audie, go ahead. My question is, how do you guys capture the animals? That's a good question. And you know what? The answer to that is a hard one and sometimes not very well. Uh, so depending on the species, there are a lot of different ways that you can catch carnivores. So you can either use like a cage box trap that's like a fully enclosed like uh, cube shape that has a trigger. So there's doors open on the edge and the animal walks in and the trap doors close and trap them in it, kind of like a crate. Um, there are other method, methods that involve having like little snares that wrap around their legs. So when an animal is walking on a trail, you would set this little snare that basically it's a circle and the animal would step, step his leg into it and it would be kind of like a little circle that wraps around his leg, kind of like this is my computer cord. So it basically kind of wrap around like this and it would hold him still. So basically, you know, we have to be careful that it doesn't get too tight or it doesn't injure the animal. So it has a limit to how tight it can go. So it doesn't, you know, risk a lot of, it doesn't like cut their leg off or anything like that. Um, and then other methods are, you can catch them doing using the same method, but like around the neck. So it just kind of holds them like, you know, a dog leash does. Um, and we always try really, really hard to be mindful of the animal's behavior. Certain traps work better than others. Um, and also you want to be able to minimize, you know, their getting hurt. So for example, gray foxes um, are really, really susceptible to getting injured. So we would never be able to use a little leg tie around them because they basically would just try to get out by moving around. So we put them in a in like a box trap that is small enough that they can't thrash around too much and hurt themselves. So you would never use like a big trap that could catch a bear for something really small like a weasel. So we use different methods and sizes based on the actual size and behavior of the animal. And sometimes it takes a really long time. Carnivores are really, really hard to capture. So you can put out a trap with some sardines in it or maybe some deer meat or even like a, you know, a live chicken that's protected, not going to be hurt. Um, and it will take several, several days, you know, weeks before an animal is willing to walk into that trap because they're naturally very wary. So it's a very long process. And I've had good luck with it, and I've also had really bad luck with it. So it's, it kind of depends. All right. Great twos, great questions. We're going to go to Winnipeg. Uh, Manitoba with Mr. Blondeau's group, and I believe he has some students from grade four, five, and six joining him. So how are we doing in Winnipeg today? Good. Hey, everybody. 
Excellent. You guys have some questions? Yeah. Well, my question was, what did it what did it feel like when you encountered your first animal? Can you repeat that for me? I was asking, what did it feel like to encounter your first animal? So, wow. Um, first animal that I ever helped collar was a black bear in Missouri. And I was assisting on the project. It was someone else's research. So I wasn't like the lead biologist. I was one of the assistants. And it was really cool because it was one of the first times that I had seen an animal that large up close. And it was really, really cool. Um, it was, it's one of those weird experience, it's a really weird experience because there is no reason that you should be that close to an animal that large. And you know, there's a lot of different research questions that don't require us to capture an animal. You can answer them without having to, you know, interfere with the animal's life. So being able to, you know, interact with something that large in that close of proximity was really, really interesting. It, they have a, like bears have a really cool smell. They just smell like, like acorns and forests and stuff. And I think that's really interesting. So taking the whole process in is really, really cool. But the, the more interesting part is you know, like once you put a collar on that animal and release them out into the world safely to go back to doing bear stuff, you can then get your information and follow him around on the landscape. So it's really, really neat, like seeing the animal in person and then getting data and saying, okay, I, like I met that bear and I saw that bear and now he's, you know, covering this large area on a landscape. And it just, it's kind of cool. I really, really appreciate it. I don't do it. I don't do any, I don't do live collaring right now. Um, but those experiences, I think, are really, really rewarding. You would have, like this, Imogene, we had one of our BGAN units in Botswana in the Okavanga Delta with a big cat scientist named Andrew uh, Stein. And he um, did a hangout for us from his camp. But later in the night, he did a Facebook Live. They just darted two lions, a male and a female. Uh, and they were collaring both of them, which was really wow. cool to see. Uh, yeah. than doing that. So that's something the classrooms could check out later on our YouTube if you want to see a little video. Yeah, I'll check it out. That's awesome. With the two lions. But uh, Winnipeg, we'll give you guys another question. Your microphone's on. And my question was, what inspired you to become a wildlife biologist? So the question is, what inspired me to be a wildlife biologist? I love answering this question because I think it's so important because you guys are all at the perfect age to, you know, start changing the world. And I know that sounds super corny, but I really, really believe in that. So when I was a kid, I grew up, you know, there was a creek behind my house and I was always really interested in watching frogs go from tadpoles to these terrestrial adults that had four legs. And I had no idea that people did that for a living. Like people go out there and they watch wildlife. I just thought it was kind of a hobby. And I also didn't know how important wildlife are to people. But I, more importantly, I also didn't know how important wild animals are for ecosystems functioning. And going through college and, you know, learning that and still having that love and that passion and that appreciation for nature really made me think, what can I do to make a difference for something that is, you know, threatened or endangered? And for me, it's a combination of, of wanting to make a positive difference and also just still being really fascinated. Like, yeah, you know, snow leopard genetics are really important and there's a lot of things that we need to do um, for their conservation, but also snow leopards are just really cool. And for me, it's about both of those things. And I think both of those are really satisfying and knowing that I can use something that I think is really cool or knowing that I can study something that's really cool and make the world a better place is I think the best way to be a grown up and have a career that's meaningful. So for me, I think that's really important. Um, and also having people being able to talk to people about my passion. I didn't realize until college that this was an option for a career. So, you know, it's really cool that you guys have the opportunity to hang out with exploring by the seat of your pants because you're able to kind of get a better idea of what, of all the ways that you could change the world. Um, and you know, having those interactions were also really inspiring to me. 
All right, well, that was a great question and a great answer as well. Uh, let's go back to Montana and see if our class has another question. She's coming. How do you make the animals calm down? So that is all like we were talking about earlier with keeping their safety, our number one priority. Part of that is calming them down and it works differently for different species. But so if any of you have ever like or if you ever see like, it works with wildlife the same way it does with livestock or even your cat. So say you take your dog, or your cat to the vet and they're scared. They're in a crate. They don't want to be there. Just want to go home and sit on the couch. If you put them in a crate or you cover them with a blanket, they often calm down a little bit. And that works with foxes or bobcats just as much as it works with deer or your pet dog. If you're able to cover something's eyes when they can't see, yes, they can still hear and they can still smell, but not being able to see actually calms them down a lot. So when we set traps to catch wild animals, we often want to make it look as natural as possible, but once we actually catch them, covering them is really, really important. Covering their eyes to make them feel, uh, it makes them feel a little bit safer, even though they can still hear and still smell. It really helps them calm down, and it makes, um, it makes things easier for us, so it also makes it faster in terms of how long we're interacting with them, so we can let them go more quickly to go back out into the wild and do wild things. All right, and let us visit our class in Winnipeg one more time. Do you guys have another question? What 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 is your what is your favorite animal that you that you've catched? Oh, oh, that's kind of a hard one. I have a really hard time picking between like carnivores and salamanders. So if you've never seen a salamander in the wild, that should be on your life goal list. Trying to see a salamander is a really cool thing. I'm a big fan of marbled salamanders, which were in that the last picture in that slide, the black and white kind of zebra looking salamander. Um, but I also, like I said, I study carnivores. I'm a big fan of them. Um, and I have a really hard time. I know I can't give you one answer. I have a really hard time deciding between bobcats and snow leopards. So obviously snow leopards aren't in North America. They're in Asia. I haven't, I've never seen one in the wild yet. Um, I'm hoping that maybe I'll get lucky and see one this summer um, when I go do some field work. But I've seen a lot of bobcats, and they're obviously a lot smaller, and they're you know medium-sized carnivores. But I'm a big fan of them because they're really, really feisty, and they are just really, really cool. They do a lot of really neat stuff. So it's kind of between those three. I'm sorry I can't pick just one. <laughs> That's okay, and I'm with you with the salamanders. Anytime I'm in the woods, I can't help but turn over a few logs or a few rocks to see what's underneath. And exactly. um, we've got quite a few species around here uh, in Ontario. Now's not a good time, it's pretty cold, but uh, in the spring, they'll definitely be a little easier to find. Yes. Um, all right, well, boys and girls, if anybody has one more question, uh, for Imogene, wave at the camera for me and I'll know we should visit your class one more time before we sign off for today. So if you guys do have another question, give away. Oh, there we go. I see a wave in Winnipeg already. So let's turn their mic on. Um, how did it feel like when you caught your first animal? Mm. The very first animal that I ever caught uh, what, let's see, like for research as a biologist, the very first thing I ever helped catch was a bobcat. Uh, and that was up in Northwest Montana, not too far from where the other classroom is based out of. And it was a bobcat that had been caught several times before and we needed to remove his radio collar. And this bobcat, we caught him 20 times in two different winters which is really unusual because they're really carnivores are really hard to catch and usually once you catch them once they don't ever want to be caught again they know the deal with the traps and they will try to avoid them but this bobcat had figured out that in the winter uh, if we set out a trap with some deer meat in it that he was gonna get a full belly which was kind of important for the winter but it felt really amazing to catch a bobcat for the first time because I'd you know, been following collared bobcats around all summer. So it was my first opportunity to see one up close and see how they kind of um, act as wild carnivores. And, you know, a wild cat is nothing like, you know, a pet cat at home. And 
it really gave me a lot of respect because they make some really scary sounds. I mean, they're not very, you know, they can be kind of big, but they're not that, like, they're not, they're not a lion size. So like, we don't think of them as big animals, but it gave me a healthy respect for this small little carnivore. And I think that maybe that is the, the takeaway theme is that seeing or interacting or catching a wild animal, it's amazing, but it also fills you with a lot of respect for these animals. And they're just so incredibly amazing. Um, and, you know, I can definitely go on and on, but they're just really cool because they're fast. They make a lot of scary sounds and they mean business. They don't, they don't want to be your friend and they don't necessarily want to be in that trap. So, you know, we have to have a good reason in order to catch them. So you catch them, collect your information and then let them go as quickly as possible. And it's always really amazing to see them run away because you know, they're going back out to do what they're supposed to do. And hopefully, you know, the things that the, the interaction that you have with them is hopefully going to help their populations in the future. All right, another great question. Um, so before we do sign off for today, I want to just give a quick shout out to Mrs. Uh, Panevsky's class in La Crosse and Mrs. Jane's class in Markham, Ontario, who started the call with us, but you never know what technology is going to do and, and they weren't able to stay in. So they'll be catching the YouTube recording uh, afterwards today. So big shout out to your classes. Um, thank you, Winnipeg. Thank you, Cospell, Montana, for hanging out with us today. It was a lot of fun to take your questions. And Imogen, of course, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Um, your passion for what you do really shines through when you present and when you answer the questions. And uh, yeah, I definitely think there's probably a few uh, students out there thinking about wildlife biology as a possible future career, no doubt. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I can't wait to see all of you guys in a couple of years as wildlife biologists so we can work together. So thanks for having me. All right, well, let me turn the microphone on, let the classroom say goodbye and thank you, and we will go offline for today. So here we go, classrooms, nice and nice. All right, once again, thanks for hanging out with us. We've got lots more events coming up this month, including some visits to see some zebra sharks at the aquarium and the turtle hospitals again, so that should be lots of fun. And, uh, oh yeah, some cool National Geographic ones with Bob Ballard, who discovered the Titanic, and Brian Scary, who's an underwater photographer. So keep an eye out for those ones coming later in the month. And for now, Imogene, once again, thanks so much. Have a great day. And we're going to sign off for today. Thank you.